Welcome. We are in Acts chapter 23 today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the resurrection. We're going to talk about uh, God's plan of restoration and how restoration is possible. We're also going to talk about what our attitude should be uh, towards our current governing authorities. And we're going to find all of those lessons here uh, in the book of Acts in chapter 23. Now, chapter 22, which, which uh, we covered last week, is Paul's address to the people. You'll remember he asks the commander of the garrison to speak, uh, and he stands up and speaks to them in the Jewish language, and all the people get real quiet, and he then states, of course, his Jewish credentials and explains to them how he was once in their shoes and once was a persecutor of the way until um, he was on the road to Damascus and encountered Christ. And everything seems to be going fairly well in his uh, testimony that he's sharing with the people until he mentions how he was called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And then the crowd kicks right back up again, um, wanting to put him to death and wanting to have him stoned right then and there. Fortunately, he is rescued by the commander of the garrison. And right at the end of chapter 22, Paul makes the commander aware that he was born a Roman citizen. And upon hearing that, it says at the end of 22, then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman because he had bound him. And the next day, uh, he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews. And he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their counsel to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. And that's where we ended the last session. So now let's continue into chapter 23. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law. And do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Well, that's a pretty eventful way to start a dialogue. Basically, as soon as Paul begins to speak, the high priest immediately has Paul struck on the mouth for simply saying that he was living his life in good conscience toward God. It could have been also that he referred to them as brethren and that they didn't consider Paul a brother, and perhaps that's why he had him struck. Um, but at any rate, that's how the high priest responded. And then Paul, of course, responds with some words in turn. What did he call them again? Let me just let me just go back to that. God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Um, that was the equivalent of really calling him a grave which would be an unclean thing. Okay, that was Paul's response. But then he's made aware that he was speaking to the high priest. And so upon realizing who it was that he was talking to, he retracts his previous statement and then quotes a scripture from Exodus chapter 22, verse 28, about not speaking evil of a ruler of your people. And when I hear something like that, I think, boy, in our culture today, I think, this is something we, we kind of need to examine. And I want to just begin by just, let's just take a look at what we know about this guy, Ananias. And I could ask you the question, do you think he was a good guy? This Ananias, who was the high priest who had Paul struck, do you think he was a good guy? I can tell you, historically speaking, he was not. And apparently the historian Josephus wrote about him and really didn't have much good to say about him but he had plenty of bad things to say about him. Ananias was the Roman appointed high priest and he was not a good dude. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but if you're into that kind of thing, you can research it for yourself. But let's just say he was a man of poor character and he often acted without the best interest of his own people in mind. Obviously that would anger people. When we look at our politics and politicians and presidents and so on today, uh, we encounter some of the same issues and certainly have similar feelings. That being said, Paul immediately walks back his previous statement once he realizes who he's talking to. 
and he quotes the Exodus 22 scripture. And you get the impression that if it wasn't the high priest that he spoke uh, that he spoke to when he said this, then he would have stood by his statement. But because of the reverence for the position that he held, Paul retracted his statement and really sort of apologized. The truth is, the Bible does teach us not to speak evil of our rulers. And I hate to say it, but I think we have lost that concept entirely, certainly in the United States, in our country, and even among Christians. Ananias was revered as a traitor and a derelict Roman-appointed ruler, and Paul still quotes this scripture from Exodus and applies it to the situation. You say, well, some politicians, they're not really worthy of that kind of respect. They've betrayed their own people. They have uh, turned their back on the nation and so on. Well, so had this guy, and yet Paul gives him the respect due his position. And it kind of reminds me of David and Saul. And you'll remember David in regard to King Saul in the Old Testament. Um, when Saul, who was really in rebellion against God and actually working against God's plan and was seeking uh, to kill David, yet David, any, even when he had multiple opportunities to attack and even, um, even to kill Saul, Saul, he wouldn't do it. Well, why? What was the reasoning that David gave? Well, I'll, I'll read you just a little bit of it. 1 Samuel 24, verse 5 says, Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And, and he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointing, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. And so David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Now, there's a couple of different times where David has the opportunity while Saul is seeking to kill him and also probably knowing that Saul had or that David had already been anointed to be the next king to take his place. Saul seeks to, to, to kill David and to go against God's plan. And yet, you know, David let Saul know that he could have taken his life. He cuts off a corner of his robe while he's sleeping and so on, but he won't stretch out his hand against him to harm him. He wouldn't do it in his deeds, and he really wouldn't even do it with his words. He felt bad for disgracing him in any way. And again, this is something that like we don't really revere positions in that same way today, and, and perhaps we should. And I think about this, of course, in relation to, to politics and um, our world leaders and things like that, that there is some respect that is due to those positions. I also think about this in terms of, um, of the ministry. You know, when we look at the scriptures, it talks about elders and such being worthy of double honor. And, you know, you don't even receive an accusation against an elder unless it's by two or three witnesses and things of that nature. Obviously, there's been abuse of power in the church uh, in the past. There's been abuse of power in politics all over the place, okay? But that doesn't negate the fact that scripturally we are instructed to show some respect to those positions. Um, and we see that example in Paul's life. Again, in 1 Samuel 26, verse 8, this is another one of those occasions with David and Saul. It says, Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I will not have it, uh, and I will not have to strike him a second time. He's like, just give me one shot at this guy, David. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or she, he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So again, he sort of shames Saul, lets him know that he was there, lets him know he had the opportunity to take his life. But ultimately, David takes all the animosity that he could have felt. Um, he could look at all of the rebellion of Saul, the things that he was doing wrong, 
um, that he was even seeking to take his life. And he takes all of those feelings, all of those emotions, and he puts it in the Lord's hands. And he says, I'm not going to be the one to take vengeance against him. I'm not going to be the one to speak against him. I'm not going to be the one to attack him. I'm going to put it in the Lord's hands and let God sort it out. And you know what? God did sort it out. And he actually did go out to the battlefield and perish. And we would do well to follow these scriptural examples and show some level of respect to our leaders, whether we like them or not. There were certainly lines David refused to cross, and at that point, he just put it in the Lord's hand. Good examples. Romans 12, verse 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now we'll carry on in verse 6 of chapter 27. It says, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. Now, Super clever move by Paul here. Uh, he is definitely thinking on his feet, or the Lord led him to do this. However, it was not only clever, uh, it to a large degree was true. The reason um, Paul is really on trial, the really central issue, of course, is Jesus Christ and his resurrection. The resurrection is like one of the most important doctrines of the Christian faith. It is like the hope of our faith. It is the resurrection. If you don't have the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you don't have the gospel. The gospel was what Paul was all about. And so that really is what we see Paul on trial for throughout the book of Acts. That's what he's getting in trouble for. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, which was also written by Paul, says, Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? See, this is nothing new. This has been going on. And there have been different groups that say, oh, there's not really a resurrection and so on. And here's what Paul responds to that. He says, but if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are all found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not written, risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. See, you don't have a gospel without the resurrection. It says, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this, this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. And that is to say that if we have hope in a Christ or in a Messiah who has not conquered and defeated death, we're just a sad group of people. Um, like, we can all just go home. We don't need to prop up this Christianity thing if there's no resurrection. Paul's essentially saying, if there is no resurrection, if the dead do not rise, if Christ is not risen, there's no point to any of this and putting your faith in any of this. So why is the resurrection so important? Well, for us as believers, for anyone really, we were never meant to live for this life. Our hope is an eternal hope as Christians, an eternal hope that is brought to us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A couple verses from 1 Peter 1. Uh, I'll begin in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Now we have a living hope and it says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Therefore, if Christ is not raised, we have no living hope. We have no hope of eternal life. Christ has pledged our resurrection in his resurrection. 
Baptism carries that symbolism that as we come out of the water, it represents being united with Christ in his resurrection. It is pointing, it's pointing back to what Christ did. It's pointing forward for what he will do for all believers. 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Christ is revealed is when the resurrection event takes place. That's why your hope fully is to be in his return, in his revelation, because that's when your resurrection is going to take place. The resurrection is everything, and thank God for it. Um, who wants to be stuck here in this life, living this out forever, fighting your flesh, fighting the devil, um, you know, battling with all the things that we battle here on the earth, only seeing in part also. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about, uh, talks about this a little bit. It says in verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. He said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And you say, well, what's he talking about when perfection has come? Well, he's talking about the time when this mortality will put on immortality, uh, where this corruptible will put on in corruption, where we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, when the dead in Christ shall be raised, and so on. That's what he's talking about. And if you don't believe me, just keep reading in Corinthians, because in within the next two chapters, that's exactly what he starts talking about. He's saying everything that we experience in this life, in our relationship with God, is really child's play compared to what it's going to be like to see him face to face. Any revelation that you think you have from God, it's nothing compared to what you're going to have when you're in his presence. I think the greatest things that we can experience this side of heaven is being filled with the Holy Spirit, being used by God, um, the presence of God. You know, when it comes upon you in, in worship or in prayer or, you know, when you're empowered by the Spirit to speak or whatever it may be, it's like the greatest thing we can experience in this life, and it's in part. It's it's a fraction. It's Paul relates it to the things of like being like childhood, like your toys, and putting the childish things away so that you can experience the fullness of God. That's the resurrection. That's what we're all looking forward to. That's what gives us a living hope, and that's why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so important. Without it, we have nothing but a pointless faith. So it's huge. Continuing on in verse 11 now, it says, but the following night, the Lord stood by him. And so now Paul is out of, you know, he's been rescued again from the crowd, ripping him to pieces and so on. And it says, in the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And you know, we had had a whole discussion in, in the previous sessions about whether or not Paul really should have gone to Jerusalem. And maybe it was a timing issue or he wasn't meant to go right then and there. And he went anyway because that was just, that was his heart. He was just purposed to do it. Okay. And maybe you believe he wasn't supposed to go. Maybe you believe he was. Paul probably is questioning himself at this point. He goes to Jerusalem with the best of intentions. He wants to see his people saved. They all turn on him. Um, they're trying to kill him on multiple occasions already. Now he's like locked up in custody, okay? And, and it says that the Lord stood by him. And I think there's this is a really precious moment, okay? There's some just beautiful, sweet redemption going on here for Paul and affirmation. Up until this point, everything was going wrong. Like, this was going bad all the way. And then that affirmation from the Lord comes. Like God said, Paul, I'm not finished with you yet. There is more work. Let me confirm the things that you are already thinking. 
That like, maybe, maybe it was a mistake for Paul to go to Jerusalem. Maybe you've made mistakes, but God still has a future. He still has a hope. He still has a plan for you to walk in. And to me, this might be the biggest lesson in this chapter, okay, is this word of restoration. Sometimes we think God is done with us because of mistakes that we've made, choices we've made, um, maybe even our age. But, you know, God is in the business of miraculous restoration. The Bible is full of examples of miraculous restoration. I think of Abraham and Sarah, you know, they, they thought they were done, but God had promised them a child and, and, you know, they were past the age where that was possible, but they did have a son just like God promised. There's so many examples throughout the scripture. And it reminds me of just one of these awesome verses that we find in, in Joel chapter two and and obviously it had a meaning for the people of that day. And I, I believe it it likely has a prophetic meaning for the future too. But there's also some spiritual application just about the character of God we can pull out of this. Joel 2.25, it says, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts, my great army, which I sent among you. He's like, I'm going to restore to you years. And this is for anybody. If you feel like you've wasted years of your life, this is for you, okay? God says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. And you go, man, my life's been a wreck. I haven't been walking in the way. Um, there's been all kinds of consequences because of my actions. You know, God even tells Israel here that, I sent the army against you, okay? I, I did this. The locusts were caused by me. The, and you can call that the loving discipline of the Lord, if you like, because God will let us get to some dire straits sometimes to get our attention. But in the end, it's for the salvation of our souls. It's that we might turn to him and look to him to be dependent on him, to look to him to be our strength, to be our help in time of need. And so he says, in verse 26, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. And then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other and my people shall never be put to shame. There's a call to repentance in this chapter and, and it opens our eyes to man, if we're willing to repent and turn to God, he can restore everything. And he's in the business of doing it. In fact, I'll say it, God loves restoring our lives and making them new. Carrying on in verse 12, it says, and when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under oath saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy and they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now you therefore together with the council suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. It says, so when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul, now, I, when I was reading this and studying, preparing for this, I was like, well, wait a minute, Paul had a sister? I was not aware of that, okay? Yes, and apparently he had a nephew also, and he gets a mention in the scriptures for saving Paul's life here in these verses. It says, then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside and asked privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him, but do not yield to them. For more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. And he called for two centurions saying, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night. 
and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. And you go, wow, just when you thought Paul was done, that his goose was cooked, there appeared to be no hope for him in this situation, and men are conspiring against him to kill him even with oaths. Not only is he rescued, he gets a whole entourage of protection. And it just goes to show you, just like um, when we talked about the governing authorities or something. Now here, these people that were Roman, they didn't know God, they didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they're being sent now to aid Paul and he's given protection from 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen, armed to the teeth to protect Paul. All I can say is, wow. And then now the commander, it says, and he wrote a letter in the following manner, saying, Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor, Felix. Greetings, this man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman, and when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council, and I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him uh, by night to Antipatris, then the next day, they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. And when they came to Caesarea and delivered the letter, the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. And when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's Praetorium. Now, my understanding is that Herod's Praetorium is one of the residential palaces built by Herod the Great. And this is absolutely hilarious because one minute, nothing could get worse. The next minute, Paul gets a word from the Lord. He is going to go to Rome. He gets that affirmation from God. He gets protection from the Romans. Now he gets to go stay in essentially like a, a, a cush, like private prison or something. And so the soldiers rescue him and he's granted to be in custody in style for sure. So, um, in the next session, we will talk about Felix, who it mentions here, um, who is the governor, and he proves to be a prominent character. And the word for today is, is simple. It's God is not finished with you. And I don't know who needs to hear that. I suppose we all need to hear that from time to time. But that was the message that God gave to Paul loud and clear in this passage. And he not only spoke it to him, but he, he really provided for Paul in a miraculous way. And not only did the Lord call him to preach in Rome, but then he confirmed it by this great rescue. And I shared this scripture in the last session, and I want to share it with you again today, and, and maybe it will just sink into your spirit and help you um, move forward and, and press on. And it's from Philippians 3, and I'll, I'll just close with this. It says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And of course, this is the Apostle Paul talking. He says, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Let's press on, church. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you're not finished with us. We thank you that you weren't finished with Paul. We thank you that your character is sure and is true for us today as well, God. 
If it's repentance that needs to happen, Lord, we come humbly before you, God. If it's fear that we need to get over, whatever the hindrance is, God, we want to lay it at your feet right now. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to move in our lives, God, and to use us in a mighty and powerful way. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.